A female red kangaroo is weighed down by her large pouch. Inside, her joey is becoming restless. After five months confined in the darkness, his face emerges for the first time. His eyes have only just opened and must adapt to the sudden glare of the sun. He looks out over the vast outback plains of Broken Hill, prime red kangaroo country. His mother is 10 years old and in perfect breathing condition. Her home is a small area of scrub where she spends most of her time feeding. The joey takes only a brief look at the outside world before retreating again to the safety of the pouch. The female keeps the pouch meticulously clean essential after many months of continuous occupation. It's now getting a little hot and cramped inside. His mother's previous offspring, a two-year-old daughter, is intrigued by the newcomer. But the attention is unwanted. Females with young joeys prefer to isolate themselves from other kangaroos. Females and their offspring form the core of a society presided over by a dominant male. This is the Big Red. He's a two-meter giant, weighing 90 kilos, more than a fully grown man. The females are only a third his size. Isolated on the open plain, the female finds a peaceful place to rest. After his first brief excursion, the joey is impatient to be let out again. But the female's in control of his movements. Only when she's fully relaxed will she release her pouch muscles sufficiently to let him squeeze out. His observations are soon interrupted. The land is colonized by a foreign force, sheep. It's home to the second largest flock in the world. In total, more than 100 million sheep live in this part of the outback. Kangaroos have a complex relationship with sheep. Sheep aren't desert creatures. And to survive here, they need plenty of water. The settlers built artificial dams to quench their insatiable thirst. Reds don't need an artificial water supply to survive, but it helps. As a result of farming, kangaroo numbers have doubled in this part of the outback in the last 200 years. Sheep farming has benefited kangaroos for another reason protection. This is the world's longest fence. It extends more than 5,000 kilometers through the heart of the Australian outback. It exists to keep dingoes, Australia's wild dogs, out of sheep country. But the wire fence is surprisingly flimsy. Brian Locke is a fence fixer. He spent 30 years repairing holes created by wombats, camels and kangaroos. His careful attention ensures that dingoes rarely break through into sheep country. Life on the outside is very different for kangaroos. Red kangaroos are only found in low numbers in the centre of Australia. Drought is frequent here, 
and water holes are scarce. The distinctive desert plants are tough and indigestible to grazing animals. Reds share this land with strange desert creatures. The dry grass plains are home to the thorny devil, a slow-moving lizard that feeds on ants and termites. Of more concern to the kangaroo is the dingo. Dingoes patrol large territories in search of prey. They're opportunists that will eat almost anything they can find. But their traditional prey is the kangaroo. The red kangaroo's first line of defense is extreme nervousness. A female with a young joey is a tempting target. A lone dingo has little chance of catching an adult roo, but may be able to make a kill if the joey is sick or injured. Unfortunately for the dingo, this joey is strong enough to outrun him. A lone dingo will only catch one in every 20 kangaroos it chases. They're much more successful at hunting when they work in packs. There are other hazards facing kangaroos in the central deserts. This is a land of fire. Aboriginal people have burnt this country for thousands of years. They use the flames to control the land and its animals. fire stick is used to flush kangaroos and other edible creatures out of the bush so they can be hunted. The thorny devil is slow to react, as is the parenti, Australia's largest lizard. Astonishingly, the desert plants need fire to survive. Once the flames have burnt out, fresh new shoots will emerge from the embers. But for now, there is only destruction. Healthy kangaroos easily flee the flames, but there are other casualties. A female, too old to find sufficient food on the barren plains, is starving. A damaged tail is the result of being caught in a fence, or perhaps from dingo attack. She's unable to leap away. Far to the east, away from the raging fires and dingoes of the centre, our joey is growing fast. He's gradually becoming more accustomed to the sights and sounds of the outback. Joeys spend one month observing the world from the safety of their mother's pouch before they step out for the first time. Despite its barren appearance, Broken Hill lies on the inside of the dingo fence and is a safe haven for red kangaroos.
The joey has more than doubled in size over the last month. He's now a heavy burden in the pouch, reaching 20% of his mother's body weight. She can still hop with him on board, but it's getting increasingly uncomfortable for both of them. His lifestyle is about to change. A kangaroo's first emergence is sudden. The mother releases her pouch muscles and he simply falls out. The joey's first taste of freedom is short-lived. He's small and uncoordinated, and after a brief stretch, he dives straight back. Safe inside, he can't be attacked by the kangaroo's key predator in this area, the wedge-tailed eagle. The eagle isn't only a threat to kangaroos. Emus nest in the scrub. Male emus incubate their clutch patiently for two months before the eggs start to hatch. They're extremely attentive fathers. Like kangaroos, emu populations have grown on the inside of the dog fence due to a ready supply of water and limited predation. The chicks are on their feet within hours of hatching. The joey takes things more slowly. Over the next few days, he spends more time exploring outside the pouch. This is an exciting playground, full of strange creatures. He returns to his mother regularly to suckle and bury his head in her dark pouch for reassurance. He sticks close to his mother as she leads him around her home range. She shows him where to graze and find water. These lessons will be vital if he's to grow to adulthood. Like all outback creatures, red kangaroos depend on an intimate knowledge of the environment to survive during hard times. During these forays, he gets his first true taste of the bush. While in the pouch he nibbled at the vegetation, now he must begin to eat properly. But the desert plants are tough, and difficult to digest. The joey relies on his mother to find the more tender shoots. In between bouts of feeding, the mother and joey relax together. He licks his mother's mouth to exchange saliva with her. It contains microorganisms which help to break down the tough plant material in his stomach.
the young Joey watches the world go by from the security of his mother's pouch. The evening gradually closes in and the desert creatures prepare for the night shift. The outback becomes more lively after dark once the heat from the scorching sun has gone. Though red kangaroos are active during the day, they're essentially nocturnal creatures and continue to feed throughout the night. Predators accompany the darkness and the kangaroos must remain constantly on their guard. Foxes were introduced to Australia in the 19th century and have since spread across the outback, destroying many species of smaller native marsupials. But a joey, if it's well guarded, isn't an easy catch for a slight fox. Only 2% fall victim to foxes. A more serious threat comes from the wedge-tailed eagle, the largest raptor in Australia. Wedge-tailed eagles nest in large areas lodged in the branches of red gum trees. Here, the female incubates two eggs that hatch within a day of each other. The second chick is always at a disadvantage. As soon as it hatches, it's attacked by its older sibling. The eagle chicks are locked in a battle for survival. In a bad year, when food is scarce, one hatchling will kill the other to avoid competition. The hatching of the hungry chicks creates a problem for young kangaroos. Eagles are just one of the threats which face the young joey as he grows up. At eight months old, the joey is still entirely dependent on his mother, but their relationship is about to change. The female has been cleaning her pouch frequently over the last two days. She's almost ready to give birth. The young male is oblivious to the events taking place. The female eases herself into position with her tail forward. Getting comfortable on the hard ground isn't easy. She eventually settles down. Female red kangaroos only ever sit like this when they give birth. She licks her fur more rigorously as the birth approaches. One single contraction is all it takes for a joey, no bigger than a coffee bean, to be born. It's been growing inside its mother for only 33 days. Now it must embark on an epic journey to the mother's pouch. It's a struggle for such a tiny creature to clamber through the entanglement of hair. But the joey has a well-developed sense of direction and smell to guide it. The newborn's older brother faces lesser challenges outside. After a three-minute marathon, the newly born reaches the rim of the pouch and climbs inside. Its tiny mouth is perfectly shaped to suckle, quickly clamping onto its mother's teat, where it'll remain continuously suckling for the next four months.
When conditions are good, female red kangaroos raise more than one joey at a time. This remarkable fecundity is key to their success in a harsh and unpredictable environment. Within two days of the birth, the female is ready to mate again. She soon attracts the attention of hopeful males. A receptive female creates a flurry of activity on the plains. A red adolescent male picks up the female scent and shadows her every move. At only three years old, he's low in the pecking order, but he has the chance of a sneaky mating while the big red is preoccupied elsewhere. The female isn't keen to mate with a lowly male, but the adolescent is persistent. With his mother distracted, this is an alarming time for the joey. The male's soft clucking and tail caressing begin to arouse the female. Males often have to invest in two or three days of courtship before the female is ready to mate. In the excitement, the joey is left behind. The adolescent is successful in his pursuit, but it doesn't go unnoticed. Unfortunately for the adolescent, his attempt is interrupted. He's not big enough to challenge the big red. In kangaroo society, size is everything. Dominance comes with bulk. It's in the female's interests to mate with the big red because his successful genes will be inherited by her next offspring. While she's busy doing so, her joey must fend for himself. With predators nesting in the trees nearby, this is a dangerous time for the joey. The low scrub bushes conceal the kangaroos on the open plain, but the wedge-tailed eagle is a specialized predator and can pick out a joey half a kilometer away. Kangaroos scatter at the slightest hint of danger. The eagle is no threat to an adult kangaroo, but its powerful talons can crush a joey. The eagle can swoop at 100 kilometers an hour. A joey can't outrun an eagle, but the little male is fortunate to dart into a creek. Here, he's hidden beneath the thick gum trees. He's lucky. At this age, around 5% of joeys fall victim to eagles. The creek is like another world, a safe haven cloaked by cooling gum trees. But this is an unfamiliar place for a red kangaroo. They're creatures of the open plain, and the joey feels lost in the trees.
threats to kangaroos come in many forms. Gigantic road trains cruise at 100 kilometers per hour across the outback. Every year, 100,000 kangaroos are killed on the highways. This female with her joey are two of them. The wedge tail will tear up the carcass into small pieces so it can be carried up to the nest. The two chicks wait expectantly in the giant eyrie, which they share with tiny nesting finches. Their mother feeds them two or three times a day on a varied diet of lizards, emu chicks and kangaroos. As the female feeds her chicks, saliva is transferred onto the meat. As with kangaroos, this helps the chicks to digest their food. Both parents will wait on their demanding youngsters for the next two and a half months. Several hours later, the joey remains alone in the creek. He's lost, unlike the creatures around him. Emerging from their winter hibernation, sleepy lizards search out their mates. After many months apart, these stumpy skinks often reunite with the same partner. The eight-month-old Joey can't yet survive a night away from his mother. He still needs to suckle every few hours. Instinct drives him to return to the open plain. Mother and Joey identify one another by smell. He seeks comfort in the security of the pouch but now his mother doesn't relax her muscles enough to let him inside. His familiar refuge is occupied by the newborn Joey. Though his mother will continue to suckle him, she'll no longer let him ride in her pouch. From now on, the Joey must learn to stand on his own two feet permanently. Now permanently excluded from his mother's pouch, the joey spends more time alone. The vast outback plains are bleached a sickly yellow by the intense summer radiation. At midday, it's too hot to move. Red kangaroos avoid overexposure by sheltering in the shade, but cool shadows are hard to find. The sheep flocks suffer under their thick wool fleeces. Unlike reds, they're not well adapted to the heat. Red kangaroos keep activity to an absolute minimum. They lose excess heat by licking themselves. Their forearms have many tiny capillaries close to the skin surface. As the saliva dries, it cools their blood. They dig through the hot soil crust to excavate a hip hole in the cooler earth below. The joey copies his mother. Though he sits apart from her now, he always keeps her in sight. Flies are a constant irritation.
They interrupt his rest and make him feel even hotter. They're not the only disturbance in the desert. A sleepy lizard makes its way through the scrub looking for a patch of shade. The joey is growing in confidence, but there are some things he's still unsure of. The lizard is no threat, but it's enough to startle him. The summer brings not only heat, but also dust. Twisting air currents whip across the heavily grazed soils. Every year, thousands of tons of the fragile topsoil are lost to the wind. The eagle chicks are now 10 weeks old. This year has been a good one, with kangaroos in plentiful supply. Both hatchlings have survived. They take advantage of the wind to test out their wings. At full stretch, they're nearly two meters across. The fledglings prepare to launch themselves for the first time. Like juvenile kangaroos, newly fledged eagles will remain near their parents for a year or so. After three months of 50 degree heat, the kangaroo plains are tinder crisp. At almost a year old, the joey is still suckling from his mother. This will be his last indulgence. From now on, he must survive solely on the desert plants. But in the height of summer, food is in short supply. Even in good conditions, half the joeys that are weaned will starve to death. The presence of sheep makes things worse for kangaroos. Their hard hooves erode the soil, and their voracious mouths tear at the vegetation. Sheep farming not only damages the outback, it also divides it with numerous paddock fences. Kangaroos do slip through, but if they leap the high wire, their legs can get caught. This kangaroo is blind. He's contracted a virus that seems to target large males. The creek offers short-term relief from the hot sun. But to the confused male, the cacophony of sound makes it a terrifying place. Thankfully, his suffering will be short-lived. Blind kangaroos survive for only a few days.
fences aren't a problem for the healthy juvenile male. During the dry season, animals flock to the man-made sheep troughs to drink. Now more than a year old, the juvenile remains in his mother's home range, but he doesn't spend much time with her. Instead, he travels alone to the places she introduced him to as a joey. Reds get most of the moisture they need from their diet and only visit troughs during the summer. In this part of the outback, the water supply rarely dries up. Water is more difficult to find on the other side of the dog fence. <coughs> Kangaroos were once thought to be migratory. Certainly in the centre, they may travel hundreds of kilometres in search of water during the dry season. Because water holes are a focus for them, they also attract patrolling dingoes. Lone dingoes keep a low profile at water, where they're likely to run into rivals. Dingoes are most active at dawn and dusk. Like all desert animals, they take it easy during the day. Kangaroos are particularly cautious around water holes where ambush is common. But in the dry season, they can't survive more than five days without drinking. Water holes are one of the few places where red kangaroos congregate in large numbers. A female with a joey in her pouch nervously approaches. Tiny tree frogs congregate in the pool to mate. Their presence is enough to make a kangaroo jumpy. Dingo tries his luck. But with an early warning, the ruse, once again, have the advantage over a lone dingo. They're too agile. Dingoes can survive several weeks without making a major kill. Their large territories contain many sources of food. Grasshoppers make a tasty mouthful. But a fresh kangaroo carcass makes a better meal. Red kangaroos commonly die of starvation in the center because of the poor vegetation. The dingo, like the crows, will take whatever it can get. Dingoes can survive in the central deserts because they're adaptable animals. They defend large territories where they hunt insects, reptiles and even birds. They'll eat almost anything. Fresh berries make a perfect dessert. Despite their ability to thrive in the outback, dingoes face an uncertain future. They're considered vermin, and hundreds are shot every year because they attack livestock. For the dingo, as well as the kangaroo, the desert is divided.
Aboriginal people are thought to have lived in Central Australia for more than 40,000 years. They have an ancient affinity with the land and its creatures. Though Aboriginal lifestyle has changed in many ways since Europeans came to Australia, their relationship with the red kangaroo has remained constant. Today they hunt with guns rather than spears. The red kangaroo is their traditional quarry. The hunters take the kill back to a temporary bush camp where it's cooked over an earth oven. The kangaroo is still prepared according to traditional ritual. It's left to cook for only an hour or so, not long in Western terms for such a large animal. The meat is still quite raw. Rifles have made Aboriginal hunters more efficient, but their impact on kangaroo numbers is minor compared to the cull, which takes place on sheep stations within the dog fence. In the half-light, shooters cruise the highways. Ironically, red kangaroos have become victims of their own success on the inside of the fence. Farmers believe kangaroos compete with sheep for food. A female is caught in the beam, but is passed over. Then a one-year-old male, but he's too small. The shooter is aiming for another target. He's after a big male. On average, one and a half million kangaroos are shot every year in New South Wales alone. But because kangaroos are prolific breeders, the cull has little long-term impact on their numbers. However, it does damage the viability of the population as a whole. This is because it selectively wipes out the big dominant males. Reds are believed to be able to smell the coming rain. The storms are infrequent, but when they arrive, they drench the desert. Reds are adapted to survive extreme heat. They can easily catch a chill if temperatures remain low. It's almost a year since the juvenile male peered out of his mother's pouch for the first time. Now a new face has emerged. Female kangaroos actually have the ability to determine the sex of their offspring. After raising an energetically demanding son, his mother has given birth to a daughter. The storms are short-lived, but the rain is sufficient to flush the plains with fresh green pick. The new shoots are highly nutritious for the red kangaroos. Energized by the cool air and a plentiful supply of food, the kangaroos become more active.
the 15-month-old juvenile is intrigued. Fighting is a ritualized affair known as boxing. The combatants lock together in a battle of brawn. They take regular breaks for a bout of scratching. Perhaps it relieves tension. These fights help to establish rank amongst the males. Some contests are short-lived, but if the males are well matched, the battle is closely fought. They keep their eyes and ears away from the raking claws of their opponent. Kicking is a defensive act, and the loser eventually backs down. Amongst smaller males, boxing is more light-hearted. The juvenile male's first fight will help establish his position. Though there's no instant benefit to winning these contests, the successful males will gain access to feeding and resting sites in the future. One or two may even get access to the females. The Big Red takes little interest in the fighting. He has other priorities. With so much competition, he'll only retain his status for a year or two. If the juvenile continues to grow in size and strength, he may eventually get the chance to challenge the Big Red. But first, he must establish his own home range on this side of the divided desert. <laughs> <laughs>